This court dispenses justice at the highest level. Everyone in the land is answerable to them. But who are they? And what makes them tick? In this film, four of them reveal how justice works. Their battles with the government, their struggle with emotion, and the responsibility of having to be right. It's 6 a.m. and Lord Phillips has been up for hours. As head of the court, what does he think you need to become one of the top judges in the country? You need a good intellect because ultimately what matters is a feel for what is the right decision. And this is a mixture of analysis and common sense, looking at the implications. It sounds a bit um, obvious that to be a good judge, you need good judgment. Lord Hope, deputy president of the court, points out the importance of temperament. You don't want to be the kind of person who rushes to judgment and, and sticks to it, come what may. You've got to be prepared to uh, adjust your own views, however hard you were attached to them to begin with, by the realization that you probably weren't right after all. Lord Kerr believes that however well they do the job, they'll face tough criticism. Each case must be approached with complete independence of thought, and hopefully uh, the outcome will bring justice. But one man's justice is another's injustice. Bye-bye, darling. Have a good day. Lady Hale is the only woman in the court. It's very difficult to say exactly what a woman uh, brings, but every judge brings their own particular experiences and background into the job. We lead different lives from men. We have no choice. And it's a good idea if those different perspectives find their way into the law. Until 2009, the highest court in the land sat in the House of Lords. They were the Law Lords. It was Tony Blair who made the decision to move them across the square and into their own building. The change, which took 10 years to enact, was intended to make a crucially important public statement that the judiciary should be seen to be free from the influence of Parliament. It's moved here primarily as the last step in the separation of powers and in particular a principle that judges should be wholly independent of those who make the laws uh, and those who are bound by them and who execute them, the administration. When the justices make their decisions, they do so not only independently of parliament, but with the unique power to reverse the rulings of all lower courts. We are the final court of appeal, and so sometimes a, a case has had to be decided a particular way by the trial court and by the first court of appeal because there is a binding precedent which tells them which way to decide it. Uh, but we, of course, uh, can say that the decisions of earlier or lower courts are wrong. By rejecting earlier rulings, they establish new precedents. In these instances, they make new case law. They also have the freedom to interpret another sort of law, parliamentary law. And here they may even find there is no past case to refer to. The law is made across the square by parliament and they churn out thousands of laws. Uh, and they're not all crystal clear. So issues arise. What did parliament mean when they enacted this? The language is confusing. Um, that's the kind of issue, if it's of great importance, uh, that we will ultimately have to resolve. Uh, and in that kind of situation, you won't have much guidance uh, from previous cases. Uh, you have to reach uh, a novel uh, decision on a novel point. This unique role means cases of particular general importance or constitutional issues will end up in the Supreme Court. 
This is why the court should be seen to be separate from Parliament. One case demonstrated this powerfully, and the public were hooked. Some MPs could end up in court as a result of investigations into their expenses. Three MPs and a Lord were accused of submitting false expenses. They argued that they could not be prosecuted in a criminal court because submitting their expenses was a parliamentary procedure and that all procedures were covered by parliamentary privilege. This privilege had originally been intended to protect MPs' right to speak freely in the Commons. It came to this court because it involved uh, an important constitutional issue. In what circumstances can the courts investigate uh, what's gone on in Parliament? So this, this was uh, an important constitutional issue, and it so happened an issue of, of considerable public interest as well. All rise. The MPs were appealing against a lower court ruling, which had rejected their arguments. It is a point of really fundamental constitutional importance. Parliamentary privilege is, is a, a phrase which everybody knows about, and um, in a way it's a kind of umbrella which can be simply put up and, uh, and people shout privilege, and you think, gosh, well, that must be an end of it. Um, and uh, in many cases it, it may be enough to scare people away. As a mark of its transparency, all the proceedings of the court are filmed, so every moment of this hearing would be recorded. These are the first criminal prosecutions of members of the House of Commons, based on a member's dealings with Parliament for over 300 years. Thank you very much, Mr. Fleming. The system is that the country's top barristers present the case to the justices. In this instance, they had to decide how far parliamentary privilege extended. Suppose uh, the member of parliament is so aggrieved uh, by what a colleague has said uh, in a parliamentary debate uh, that he confronts his colleague in the bar uh, and he stabs him. Uh, my friend Mr Fitzgerald accepted in answer to my Lord Lord Kerr that this is not covered uh, by uh, privilege. The defence wanted to make it clear that the MPs weren't trying to avoid judgment, but that they believed it was Parliament that should do the judging. This is not and never has been an attempt to take them above or outside the law. These are proceedings to ensure against them are dealt with by the correct law, the law of Parliament. The court had to decide whether the ancient claims of privilege laid out in the Bill of Rights were being abused or whether they were actually applicable. After a two-day hearing, the justices reached a unanimous verdict on the MP's appeal. Each of these appeals is dismissed. The reasons will be given later. The court will now adjourn. It was decided that scrutinizing the claims would not infringe freedom of speech or debate. The only thing it would inhibit is the making of dishonest claims. Oh, by no means was it a foregone conclusion. It may have appeared uh, to be, uh, to admit of an obvious answer, but uh, that certainly was not the case. Their ruling paved the way for David Chater to go to prison. I think if we'd ruled in the other direction, the man in the street would say, well, I think there's something wrong here because if one's dealing with criminal offences, you'd expect it to be criminal courts who resolve it. They're the ones who are best equipped to do it. They've got all the rules, the rules to protect defendants apart from anything else. Um, it's a little bit strange if they simply can't inquire into what looks like a, an allegation of an ordinary crime uh, because uh, it involved parliamentarians or took place in Parliament. Since the court opened, it has ruled on a wide range of controversial cases. Two convicted paedophiles have won the right to challenge their inclusion on the sex offenders register. The Supreme Court today ruled in a case which goes to the very heart of Jewish identity and that age-old question, who is a Jew? The importance of the court's independence has been highlighted by the increasing number of cases where the individual citizen is in conflict with the state. Much of the legal cut and thrust now revolves around the finer points of the Human Rights Act 
as in this case, where the justices had to decide whether British soldiers are protected by the Act when serving abroad. If Private Smith was not under the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom, then whose jurisdiction was he under? Is that Actually, not really the nub of the problem? The fallback position here is 81C. No, it isn't. In prison, or in such a place, or in such circumstances as to require an inquest under any other act. Yes, sir, the Human Rights Act. Ah, you think that that's, that's what that refers to. Oh, neat solution. Yes. <laughs> but the ruling went against the soldiers. The Supreme Court has ruled that British troops are not protected by the Human Rights Act when they are on the battlefield abroad. In another human rights case, gay asylum seekers won their right to stay in the UK. To compel a homosexual person to pretend that his sexuality does not exist is to de deny him his fundamental right to be who he is. As these justices handle the most significant and sensitive cases in the country, how they are chosen is obviously crucial. They are appointed by an independent panel of other lawyers and professionals, not by politicians. We are very fortunate that we are not political appointments. Um, I don't really know what politics, if any, my colleagues have. Could you be seen to be political? It's not our business, and um, people might use the adjective of political against us, but that's not what we're about at all. We're the antithesis of politics, really. We're, uh, we're, we're detached from the political process. Uh, we've been removed from the House of Lords in order to make it absolutely clear we're detached from that process. Court rise. However neutral they believe they are, judges have often been criticized for being remote from real life and therefore ill-equipped for the job. So what is the background of these judges? And what was it that tipped them into a life in the law?